So uh, thank you to our worship team. Amen. All right, now I'm going to ask you a question. But I, I'm going to wait until Holly gets back to the thing so you can see this picture. <laughs> Anybody here remember playing the game Red Rover? Okay, okay. This could, could have totally been a picture taken from St. Mary Magdalene Elementary School where I went to school. If you don't know the game, um, the uh, participants form a human chain and they stand uh, apart from each other and the human chain is to prevent other people from breaking through. And the game starts when the first team yells, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Sherry right over, okay? <laughs> now, in my example here, I said to Amy, because I think Amy Jolly could have really built up a head of steam and broken through that line, right? Amen. Now, apparently, if you're young, you haven't been able to play this game because it's been banned because... People were clotheslining one another. <laughs> Where else can you close on your friends? But I want to start an adult league, so who's in? I'm, I'm, I will take you out. Okay. <laughs> the worst part of the game, though, is when people were linked up and you'd get called and you knew, you knew where you could break through, right? Those poor people were always the last ones picked for teams and they ended up, no matter how they tried with all their might to hold hands, they were the weakest link. You ever heard that saying, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link, right? So, whether we look at folks and think because they're small, or they're weak, or they're different, or they're not as smart, we have our own definitions of, uh, of who the weak link might be. And our weak link definitions might work for Red Rover, but when it comes to God, the definition turns upside down. There's this countercultural way that God looks at weakness, and at, at first glance, we don't usually see it. That's just the truth, because we're human beings. But when God sees a weak link, he sees an opportunity for strength. He sees an opportunity to show up and show off. Now, we've been walking through this series, The Unbroken Chain, exploring the lineage of Jesus. We have been looking at this incredible line of people on Jesus' family tree and all people God used leading to Christ. And what's amazing to me, the thing that excites me the most is this chain of connection didn't stop with Jesus. It continues on today. We're a part of that story. Amen? Well, the truth is, um, I can often feel like I'm too weak or too imperfect to be a part of Jesus's family tree. On my not-so-good days, when I'm down on myself, um, I listen to my inner critic. Has anybody got one of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm listening to this voice that I have inside my head telling me that I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough or I'm not enough. When God says, you are chosen, you are loved, you are cherished, you are more than a conqueror, and then I say to myself, whose voice do I want to listen to, right? All day, every day, whose voice do I want to listen to? Because, I mean, I don't doubt God, what, what God can do, but I sometimes doubt what I can do. Does that make sense when I say that? If you feel that way, sometimes you are not alone, but that's not a bad place to be. Because instead of, instead of thinking we can accomplish everything on our own, we got this. That's not God's way. It's not God's way at all. See, um, when I was, I don't know if this was your experience, but when I was 17, I knew everything. <laughs> right? Sorry if you're 17. Because by the time you turn 18, you find out, you know, I was hot stuff. I had life all figured out until life convinced me otherwise. Life has a way of doing that, doesn't it? But it's really not a bad thing. 
I shared this at the, um, sorry, Holly, I shared this at the 830. Oftentimes when, when I'm praying for family members, I don't pray for their lives to get better. I pray for them to get so bad that they have to cry out to Jesus because that's the last place they would ever turn. Do you know what I'm saying when I say that? It's like, Lord, please help this person come to the end of themselves. And there's a reason for that. Because our weakness is an opportunity for God. That's why we do so many testimonies around here of people who were lost and then found. Why people um, who, who have been uh, absolutely fearful and, and broken. And, and, then, and in that place, they reach out to God and they allow people to come around them. And, and God does an amazing thing. He transforms them right in front of our eyes. There's nothing better than that. Amen. See, the good news is that despite our weakness, and we've all got them, God sees human weakness as a chance for godly strength. And that doesn't make sense because, because we think like humans, but he thinks like God. He thinks like an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful being, and he sees things in us that we simply can't see. So when God looks at you and me, he doesn't see our weakness. He sees our potential. He doesn't see us as hopeless or insignificant or he doesn't see, there is not a lost cause on the planet according to God. And isn't that great news? He sees a chance for him to move in our lives and be our strength. And his grace is enough. That was a perfect pick for this morning. And you guys killed it today. Um, his grace is enough. So the theme of human weakness um, being a chance for godly strength is all over the scripture. Um, the Lord spoke this through the prophet Isaiah. Read it with me, please. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Anybody feel weary? Anybody feel weak? He wants to be your strength and your power. And we'll tell you how to get there in a little bit. Now, this was good news for the people that Isaiah was speaking to because they were about to face exile and they were in despair and they were discouraged and they had no idea what was coming next for them and they had fear. And God uh, promised through this prophet that he would give them strength and he did. And then Paul the early church missionary and church planner caught on to this idea. Now, when we think about Paul, we like, what a brave guy, what a strong guy. Um, he traveled all over, he confronted all these difficulties and he navigated conflict and he helped many people then and now discover the way of Jesus. But he, by his own admission, was weak. He said he had a thorn in his flesh and it plagued him. We don't know what it was, but he said that my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. He said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. It's so nobody would think Paul's doing this. It was all a work of God and the Holy Spirit that gave Paul the impact that he had in his ministry. He wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Weakness can be an opportunity for God's strength to break through. And Paul declared his grace is enough. There are no weak links in the kingdom of God. God's strength is enough. Today we're going to look at the next person from this genealogy of Jesus that could have been defined as a weak link many times over for all kinds of reasons and it's David we're going to talk about David this morning now when we first think about David we might think about a, a soldier he was the king of Israel it was written that he was a man after God's own heart and it sounds like the perfect example of strength to me and when I was a little kid I heard all the stories about David 
uh, but some of us adults know that his story was not always up and to the right with his relationship with God. So his uh, weakness was a, an entirely different thing as an adult. And there are children in the room. You know what I'm talking about. I was so disappointed once I grew up and read the Bible. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I thought this guy really had it together. He was a sinner. And he was guilty of some of the more serious of the Ten Commandments, right? And we see through David's life, he experienced the consequences of his sins. But guess what he did? He turned away from them. And guess what else? I thought if that guy can turn away from what he did and get back into God's good graces, there is hope for me and hope for you. Amen? <laughs> All right, so when we're going to look at David's story this morning, we're going to go all the way back, all the way back. And I'm just going to tell you the story. The scripture is about that long. So I'm going to tell you the story this morning. Everybody with me? All right, it so begins with a prophet named Samuel. And uh, here's this prophet, and he was not a very popular guy because he was speaking the truth as God told him to speak. And who wants to hear the truth, right? <laughs> but God had told this prophet Samuel that he had chosen a new king. And he said this new king is living in Bethlehem. And God told Samuel to travel there. And look for a man named Jesse, because the new king was going to be one of Jesse's sons. So God told Samuel he will know, God will let him know which one of these young men it is. So Samuel goes to visit Jesse. Jesse parades out seven strapping sons. I imagine they were full of confidence that they would be the one that would be anointed king. And Samuel's ready to anoint. I mean, he is just chomping at the bit thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find our new king and I'm going to look for somebody strong and smart and big and that. Oh, I can't wait to do this. I'm going to anoint him. I'm going to take him home and all will be well. Well, all seven of these boys come out, and one by one, they were presented tall and handsome and strong, full of vigor, full of confidence. Samuel senses a prompting from the Lord saying, no, no, not one of these. Here's what God says. Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance. Read it with me. But the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Now, while the world might have some standards or guidelines to determine what makes somebody worthy to be chosen, God looks at something else. What's going on in here? So Samuel, still not seeing the son to be king, says, are these all the sons you have? There were seven of them. Are these all the sons you have? Because he's like wondering if he's getting some mixed signals. Jesse says, well, they're still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Well, was Jesse holding out on him? I mean, why wasn't this youngest in this original lineup? Let's look again. Jesse replied, and he referred to his son as the youngest. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. This wasn't a statement about the literal age of his son. What it is is a statement about his position, his standing and status. And in the original language of Hebrew, the word for youngest is kind of a little bit of an insult. It's katan and it's small and young and unimportant with an added idea of weakness. Nah, not worthy. What Jesse is saying here is, yeah, I have another son, but you're not going to want him young, small. Surely he wouldn't qualify to be a king. Yet what does God do? 
he took the one who wasn't considered worthy by the world and chose him to be the king. So young, small David arrives. Samuel sees him. The Holy Spirit falls on Samuel, and he anoints this young man king. Scripture says, as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Well, he didn't look like a king on the outside, but God looked at the heart and knew who he was. Weakness to the world was redeemed strength from God. Now, that strength and size would continue on through David's life, and we're going to remind you of a story that I absolutely am sure you heard of in Vacation Bible School. And um, this is going to be a name that you are familiar with because a little while after David's anointing, the Israelite army found themselves facing a threat by a behemoth named Goliath. Okay, you did go to Sunday school. Good. Goliath, Scripture says, was a giant. He was nine feet tall. He was part of the Philistines. That was an enemy group warring against God's army of Israelites, and they were King Saul's, under King Saul's leadership. And what happened was, because nobody could beat Goliath, Goliath challenged the army to go man to man, mano e mano, and winner take all. And what that meant was all. The army would be captured, the people would be captured, the nation would be captured, uh, their God, their, their, their worship would be over of the one true God is winner take all. And I got to tell you something, Goliath called the Israelite soldiers to shake in their sandals. I mean, who's going to go up against this guy? Who is brave enough to go up against this guy? Everyone was terrified him, of him. Everyone except one. <laughs> Young David. He's visiting his brothers. He's not in the army. He's too young and he's too small for that. So, you know, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if he was bringing them lunch. But he hears Goliath roaring across the valley, taunting the soldiers, speaking against the nation of God, against the chosen people, and against God himself. And this lights a fire in David's bones. How dare that man talk against my God and these people? Well, King Saul hears of David's outrage and he asked to meet with him, and I have to tell you, it's crazy what happened. Here's what happened. Um, David, young, small David, says this to King Saul, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And this guy has been a man of war since his youth. He has been fighting his whole life. This young shepherd boy was ready to take on this giant that the rest of the army feared. And once again, David was dismissed. Too young, too small, too weak. Did that stop him? We would not be talking about him this morning if it did. The doubt from everyone else did not deter him, not one bit. He knew what God had called him to do, and he knew that his strength and courage came from a source other than himself. It came from God. So David knows this because he's had some experience. Because he's a shepherd, he's been out in the field doing his thing, 
And he has had a couple of encounters, and he shares them with King Saul. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. He says right out loud, who rescued him? Who rescued him? Amen. It was the Lord. His victory didn't come from his own effort, his own ability, his own strength. The Lord rescued him before, and it would be the Lord who would rescue him again. Even facing this great battle with high stakes, David looked to God above all else for strength and courage to win this battle. Trusting God to guide him, and based on his experience with God, he was ready. I want to say this. I, I mention this a lot. You look back over your life. Has God seen you through everything you've ever been through? Do you think he's going to bail on you now? No. God is going to see you through. David made his way to the valley. I want you to picture this. Into the valley to confront Goliath. <laughs> right? This is little kid and this huge giant. And the giant hurled insults at him. He cursed David in the name of his own gods. But even then, David remained steadfast. He didn't get shaken. He was steady. And now young David speaks to the giant. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Amen? Amen. Whose battle is it? Amen. It's not David, it's the Lord's. Picture young David confidently. It had to come from God. Confidently standing across from this giant. He's only got a slingshot and five smooth stones. And by declaring his dependence on God and otherwise weak, David is infused with supernatural strength. And in repeating whose battle it is, David stands face to face with the giant. He took that slingshot, hit that guy right in the head, and he went down. He went down like a rock. I want to ask you a question today. What giant are you facing? What giant are you facing? What, what battle is in front of you that is just too big for you? Who's your Goliath? What's your Goliath? Do you feel sometimes like a weak link in the chain? Do you have an undefeatable foe? Maybe it's mental illness. Maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's a hurt or a habit or hang up, you just cannot seem to overcome it. You've tried and you've tried and you've used every weapon in your arsenal. Maybe it's anger or worry or insecurity. Who or what seems unbeatable? <laughs> Do you know the Lord wants to be your champion? He wants to go into battle for you. Artist Dante Brown wrote these words, you are my champion. Giants fall when you stand. Undefeated every battle you've won. Read that next line with me. I am who you say I am. Who are you believing? Are you believing old voices? Are you believing the world? Are you believing your own little thing whispering in your ear or do you want to believe the Lord of hosts the most high God who do you want to believe I am who you say I am you crown me with confidence I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated 
undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. He has conquered it all. And I know that I have needed God's strength so many times. So many times. Sometimes the battle just seems too big. And I know I am weak, but thou art strong. And yet I try and I try and I try to win those battles by myself anyway, even knowing that. Man, that's frustrating. But victory is not found when I try to fight on my terms. It's a strange paradox. I can only have victory in the battle when I surrender to God. The battle belongs to the Lord. Whatever you're fighting now, the battle belongs to the Lord. And that's David's whole attitude instead of tensing up in fear or thinking to himself, I got this, or hiding. He humbly depends on the Lord. The scripture, the scriptures in the life of Jesus, Jesus was so humble. You know, we say this, he could have pressed that God button any time. But he humbly, humbly came. He could have commanded angels to do whatever he wanted, but, and he could have had everyone on this planet serve him, and he humbly came as a servant. The life of Jesus proves to us that if we humble ourselves, he'll lift us up. If we admit our weakness, then we can find strength from a higher power. If we confess our ignorance, just like I don't know everything, I need to be teachable. No matter how long I have been a follower of Jesus, I'm always learning new stuff. How about you? Yeah. We can never, never plumb the depths of all there is to know about God. It's beautiful. We confess our ignorance, we'll find new wisdom. If we confess our fear, he'll infuse us with his courage. Even if we're scared, we can do it anyway because we know God's with us. If we remain teachable, flexible, we come under God's authority. Things happen in our lives that we never, ever could give credit to anyone else but God. David's example teaches us something about strength that can shape the way we live. He shows us real strength is rooted in humble surrender to God. To be humble means to recognize that I don't have all the answers. It means no matter how long I've been walking with Jesus, there's still more to know and and deeper to grow that that God is the one who supplies the transformation in my life. I want to get personal for a minute and use I language here. It's saying God is God and I am not. I'm not the source of my own strength. I'm not the source of my transformation. I have to come to God without an agenda. God doesn't need my advice at all. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. I come just as I am with both strengths and weakness and trust that God's wisdom and strength are far more greater than mine. And then there's a surrender. Surrender isn't how many of us know. Wouldn't it be awesome if surrendering was a one and done? Oh, it would be awesome. I have to surrender sometimes several times a day. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad I'm not alone. Um, Surrender is a daily choice, sometimes moment by moment, to lay down our control, our perceived control, (laughs) and let God lead. It's trusting him in our fears and our uncertainties and our plans and even our weaknesses. It's knowing that he can take all of it, whatever's going on, if I would just lay it at his feet, he can turn 
all of it into something good because I love Jesus and I want to live according to his will and I know you do too. It says, God works, not me, not you. God works all things together for good to those who love him, right? You love him to so those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's for his glory. It's for his name's sake. It's not so anybody here can say, oh, we're not trying to make Grace Church popular and we're not trying to make anybody in here popular. We're trying to make the name of Jesus known. Amen. It's all for his glory. It's for his name. That's why we have these amazing testimonies that say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Glory to God. All I did was participate with what he was trying. Finally, I began to participate with what he was trying to do in my life. When we put humility and surrender together, then we can find real strength. We find the courage to face life battles, no matter what they are, not in our own power, but in the power of God coursing through us. How do we do this? Well, I want to suggest a couple things. One is, is that you start your day in prayer. Now, I am easily distracted, so I have to write mine out, and that, that helps me because in the morning, I, if I don't do that, I'm like thinking about all the things I need to do and thinking about all the places that I, I'm going to go, and I just need to begin my day saying, God, this is your day, and I am your girl, and, and I want to surrender to what you want to do in me and through me today. It's a great way to start the day. I ask God to guide the day, and I thank him for another day of sobriety and to be clean. And, um, and Lord, I hope, I hope this day is good. And then when I feel weak or unsure, it's become a practice to just take a minute to pause, to not react to things, but maybe to just pause and say, hey, Lord, I, I need some guidance here. I need some strength here. Does anybody need that through the day? Do you have people in your life? Because probably you do need that through the day to be able to just pause, take a breath, take a breath and ask God to show you the way. And then the third thing is to practice gratitude. This is the month of gratitude. And just um, remember all the ways that God has been faithful to you through the years. And he's brought you to this place no matter what you've been through, things you never, ever thought you would ever be able to handle. Well, you did because God helped you. And, and things that you never, ever thought you'd be able to face, well, you got through that one too by the power of God. And I want to say again, you think he's brought you this far to abandon you? He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His goal is for you to be so surrendered to him that you would have godly wisdom, godly power, godly strength day to day, one day at a time, one moment at a time. So I want to invite you to begin this humble surrender to God. And, and we're going to close in prayer now. I want to ask the band to come forward. And I want to tell you, um, we have a ministry here called Come to the Cross. And if you come and kneel in front of the cross, somebody will be right there to pray with you and for you. And I want to ask if you have a giant that seems so great that you cannot overcome it. And I want to ask you if you have something that you have tried and tried and tried and tried to overcome and you're just beat. This would be a great day for you to come and surrender that battle to the Lord. And there's a lot of help around here. If you let it be known to, to one of the pastors here what that is, we want to come alongside you and help you in your journey. So uh, I'm going to say a prayer, and I want to invite you to come up. And if you don't need someone to pray with you, you can head for that side. But let's go ahead and turn our hearts toward the Lord Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we're so grateful that we can. 
God, we're all facing giants. We're all facing battles in our lives. God, we are so thankful that we can lay them at the foot of the cross. We thank you, God, that when we surrender, you can fill us with your strength, trusting that you will work powerfully through our willingness to just lay it down, to say, I can't, you can, and I'm going to let you. Friends, we need to let him. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come to the cross.